Welcome to Pierce Podcast. I'm Mike. And this is Orlando. And we're on episode 187. Yeah. A level up preview. Yeah. Good. They're all good. But this one, this is another life changer. I was going to say game changer, but it's a life changer. Yeah. You know, I'm actually pleasantly surprised. Um, We're reading, uh, obviously, you probably saw the title, uh, but we're reading How to Win Friends and Influence People. And this is one of those books that's been around forever, right? It's it's a, a classic at this point. And it's one of those books that just sounds super scammy. Like, I feel like... Really? It, to, well, just the title, right? Like, the title to me, How to Win Friends and Influence People, I don't know, it just kind of has this, like, scammy feel to it. And so, I, I, I wasn't 100% sure what to expect. I knew there's a lot of great reviews on it. Uh, but there have been other books that, you know, have had amazing reviews. And I've kind of looked at and like, this is just surface level garbage. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I've been very pleasantly surprised. I feel like this book has been... Um, extremely helpful and very practical, which is really nice because sometimes you get books that are, you know, very theoretical and I, and I love those. I get a lot from them. And then you get some books that are are practical, but you're kind of like, I don't really under- know if I agree with the philosophy behind it. But this book, I, I feel like is the right kind of practical. Like it gives you just, here's, here's a, a good principle to live by. Here are some examples of how it works out in life. And then it moves on to the next one. And it's like, man, these are, these are like, game changers. These are good. And and it's things that most of us already know, maybe to an extent, but it's one of those things like just having it reminded and kind of thrown out like, oh yeah, that is kind of how human beings work. No, yeah? I agreed. Agreed. And when I think of scammy, I think like think and grow rich. Like that, that, well, we found that it was. <laughs> I mean, by the way, if you have no idea what we're talking about, we strongly recommend you go check out our episodes. Check out the, check out both. But if you really want to know what we're talking about, it's the last one we did about that book. Did we do two or three of those? I, that we, I think I we think gave we up after did two. One. Did we only do one? I think we only did one. Wow. Okay. So check out the one episode that we did. But he, here's the thing. This book. So there's a lot of books like this. So have you ever read the Fill Your Bucket book? Yeah, I think that's a newer book. I think a lot of books have kind of taken principles from this one. Yeah. Like and this maybe one that's a book we'll do in the future too. I don't know. I mean, there's there's so many good books. But, but this book stuck out to me because... I can personally relate to the principles in this book. I already did a lot of these principles and it just validated a lot of the stuff. And, you know, as a reseller, I think a lot of people got out of the nine to five, got out of, you know, wherever they were at because they got tired of people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Let's be honest, right? People are what make life, what makes life difficult, right? People didn't exist. But then again, you can't live without people. (laughs) It's this, it's a really tough scenario. Right. And, and he actually starts the book. This I'm going back, not even to like the beginning of the book. I'm going to his, uh, I think it's his, pre- not even the, oh, yeah, it's his new preface. So he has a 1981 preface. And then he has this, how this book was written and why. And it depends what version you have. But let me read this real quick. He says, Dale Carnegie says, says here, dealing with people is probably the biggest problem you face, especially if you are in business. Right. And it, it's 100% true. If you moved up to a supervisor level, it's especially true, right? If, if you've done reselling and you deal with customer service, it's true. When you're on social media, it's true. I mean, it, it relates to various aspects of your life. And then he goes down, and I really liked what he said here because I've dealt with this personally and I've gotten backlash for this personally. And I, I think it's a great start to the book because as resellers or as entrepreneurs, we think if we just work hard, we're going to be successful, which... It's true. You can be, but you can actually expedite that success by applying principles that we're going to talk about as we read this book. So let me share the story he shares real quick. For many years, I conducted courses each season at the Engineers Club of Philadelphia and also courses for the New York chapter of the American Institute of Electrical Engineers. A total of probably more than 1,500 engineers have passed through my classes. They came to me because they had finally realized after years of observation and experience that the highest paid personnel in engineering are frequently not those who knew the most about engineering. One can, for example, hire mere technical ability in engineering, accountancy, architecture, or any other profession at normal at nominal sal- salaries. But the person who has technical knowledge plus the ability to express ideas, to assume leadership, and to arouse enthusiasm among people, that person is headed for higher earning power. Yeah. So just to, to put that in clear language, um, <laughs> if, you, if you can deal with people better, if you've got people skills, you're going to make more money. 
It's it's true. It's 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 a sad it's a sad but it's a true fact and I mean it's not really a sad fact if you think about it. Like if you work for a company, you want the people who are above you to and the people who are are giving you instructions and leadership and guidance to be people who you feel listen to you and care about you and have your best interests at heart and aren't, you know. I mean we all know the people who it's like, yeah, this person is great at their job, but they're a terrible boss, right? Nobody wants to work for that person. And so it, it makes sense. Like it's it's not even a bad thing. Like we look at that and say, like, it's good that the people who are best with people make the most money because those are the people we want to work with and those are the people we want to ultimately be. But it's such a hard thing to understand. It, 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 for instance, I, I'll give you an example. Years ago, I knew an individual who had for years, years worked in a certain department. And then this new person showed up and this new person was, you know, brand new, out of college, had all the skills necessary. And, you know, from the very beginning, it came in like a rock star into this new place. Was loved by multiple people and knew who to talk to, engaged the right people. And within five years, this individual was promoted to a supervisor position over the individual who had been there for years upon years. And I remember seeing the resentment in that individual and saying, why, why wasn't I chosen? Why wasn't I elevated? This, this new guy doesn't even have half of the knowledge that I have, but somehow he's in charge of me. And, and this individual struggled this whole time. But the reality is this new person knew, I don't want to say knew the game, but understood how to win friends and influence people. He made friendships with the right individuals. He was positive. He had people behind him. And when this move happened, in the end, he was winning because the other person was all by themselves. They, they depended that whole time for their hard work to kick in. And I know this is really hard. I, I would say as a reseller, like I, I think a lot of us, even myself, I, even though I'm a very you know vocal, I'm an extrovert person, I, I don't like dealing with people sometimes. That's part of what I love why I love reselling. But even reselling, you have to have the skills to network. You have to have the skills to negotiate, even at the lowest levels of garage sales to the highest levels of dealing with wholesale distributors. Even, you know, those that are influencers have to learn how to, you know, navigate people. And so really encourage all of you, whatever it is in life, whether it is you're, you're dealing with as a reseller, whether you're at a job right now at a nine to five, and you're like, hey, I've been working hard this whole time, but I'm not advancing anywhere. This podcast should help you be able to at least apply principles that can get you to that place. No, absolutely. And as we get into the book, one of the things that I like, um, we're going to do um, a little less than half of it today. Uh, but one of the things that I like is you can almost just read the like little quote at the front of each chapter and then the principle at the end of the chapter and really get like a, a the gist of what's going on here. And then inside of the chapter, there are lots of, of examples of how this plays out and, and ways that you can implement it, practical ways that it, it would look in, in your day-to-day -day life. Uh, but like, for instance, the very first chapter of the book is called, If You Want to Gather Honey, Don't Kick Over the Beehive. And really the, the principle in this first chapter is to not criticize others. Like if you were to really just like break it down into like one phrase, is don't criticize. And the example that he gives right off the bat is um, you can look at almost every major criminal that, that especially famous ones, right. That have done just the most horrendous things. And at the end of the day, almost none of them like take blame on themselves and say like, I'm at fault for this, but they all want to kind of self justify. Like they had a reason for doing what they're doing or they see themselves in the best light. And the reality is that's all of us, right? Like none of us receives criticism. Well, um, if you are criticize something you do, the first thing you're going to do is get defensive, right? Well, the reason I did this was because of this, or you don't really know, or if you understood, and uh, the, even if somebody's trying to help you out, right? Like a, a, a true, I would say the, the sign of somebody who's really wise beyond like the norm is somebody who can actually take criticism well, even if it's not presented well, but to say, hey, maybe there's something in here, but that's not natural, right? Naturally, we want to, uh, our, our defenses go up and we don't want to to deal with that kind of criticism. And so the same is true with others, right? So whether it's an employee you have, whether it's a friend you have, whether it's a spouse, whatever it is, whoever it is in your life, maybe somebody you're trying to negotiate with, and we saw that with the Chris Voss book, is you kind of have to find a way to influence people 
by, and this idea of if you want to gather honey, don't kick over the beehive. And another phrase people say is, you know, stuff like you can gather more flies or you can <laughs> gather check. more bees with honey <laughs> or whatever it is, right? Or bears with honey, like whatever the, the phrase ends up being. Just be nice. Yeah. <laughs> and, and basically the idea is, and there's a lot of examples in here, but if somebody does something wrong, instead of your first reaction being like, how come you did this? And you cost our company this, you did try and find the positive in it and encourage them. And there were some amazing examples in here. Like one was uh, a, the, a president who was in a, an airplane and the person put in gas instead of jet fuel or put in jet fuel instead of gas. And it caused the airplane to crash and almost cost a bunch of people their lives. And instead of going up to this guy and like firing him, like, how dare you did this? The guy was obviously like ashamed. He was crying. He was upset. And I'm pretty sure his president walks up, puts his arm around him and goes, I know you'll never do this again. And to prove that, I'm going to have you service my my uh, plane tomorrow. Right. And it's that that kind of like instead of just saying, like, how dare you? You're you're a horrible person. How could you do this? It's it's extend praise where you can try and find the positive in something. And he even uses example of like Abraham Lincoln of of instead of um, sending somebody something like critical, he would actually write out the critical letter and then never send it. And instead, try and find something positive to say. And just think about how that would look in your life. If, if instead of criticizing somebody, as soon as you get a chance, you try to find some positive and you try to encourage them and extend more trust. Obviously, don't be a doormat and discipline where you need to discipline if you're an employer or a parent or whatever it is. But if you if your natural default is criticism, it's not going to be received well and you're probably not going to get the reaction you really want to get. And I love the examples that he gives. I mean, it's interesting that he uses criminals. I was kind of thrown back a little bit. And I, I love that it's like old 1930s, like Al Capone and and whoever the other individuals are that I never heard of. It's interesting because the book does go back and forth between when it was written and, and published back in the 1930s to current scenario. It kind of threw me off a little bit at times. But, you know, it's, it's understood that no one likes to be criticized. And I, I like what he says here. He says on page eight, of the edition that we have. If you want to have the same edition, check our link below. It says, let's realize that the person we're going to correct and condemn will probably justify himself or herself and condemn us in return. Or like the gentle Taft, and he's talking about the president, will say, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. Right. And, and that's super important to know. It's we we are very defensive all the time, right? As humans. Right. I, I think all of us have our our hills that we're willing to die on. Right. And especially when people attack our character or especially when people attack an idea that we thought was solid hundred percent, it's very hard to take criticism. Right. And, and whether you're a leader, whether you are a coworker, there has to be ways to be able to encourage someone. And, and it gives great examples. We'll talk about those in a little bit that you can encourage individuals without, without being critical. I mean, again, these are such simple things. You think about, we talk about Chris Voss and never split the difference in negotiation, right? Whenever you're trying to buy something, when you start going right away, criticizing everything that an item has to try to get that lower price, most of the time it doesn't work too well, especially if the item is something that is close to that person's heart and they're emotionally attached, they're not going to want to work with you. But if you are encouraging, if you are like, wow, this is a great piece. And I'm not saying that you do it to drive the price up, but you let the person you value and say, hey, I understand why you would think this would be cost this much and why it's 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 such a valuable piece for you. Or even when you're at work, like I understand why you believe this to be such a good plan. You spent a lot of hours doing this. You spent all this time putting it together. And this meant a lot to you. So let's discuss a way that we can come to an understanding as to why maybe we should kind of work things out a little bit differently. There, there's ways to positively engage people in different, different avenues. Yeah, And I love that, like the, the Abraham Lincoln section of this was great. And one of the mm -hmm. things I liked about it uh, was he starts to say that when Abraham, when Lincoln was younger, he actually wrote a very, very critical um, uh critique against somebody and it came to the point where the other person wanted to duel like we're going to duel over this and and lincoln was kind of a pacifist didn't really want to duel and so was trying to get out of it but there was no way out of it and it got to the point where like they were ready to duel and their seconds ended up kind of stopping it and then ended up being okay and it said like after that moment it was kind of like a turning point in lincoln's life but I, I just think like culturally like maybe one of the reasons we struggle so much as a culture immediately jumping to criticism is there really isn't very much like 
uh, tangible consequences, right? Like there might be, there might be a breakdown in relationships, but when you're upset with somebody and so you criticize or you're upset with the way a deal went or something's going on at work, you criticize and maybe there's like now tension, but that's not as tangible as you've now offended somebody. You said like, you're horrible at your job or you're whatever. There's not really any consequences that come, but what if, what if we lived in a time where they were like, all right, well, let's duel. You've now insulted my honor, right? You might be a little more cautious to say, yeah, before agreed. I jump to criticizing, I better make sure that this is the last resort that I possibly can come to. Because if I'm going to essentially call out somebody's honor and and accuse them of being a, a dishonorable person or a terrible person, there might be real world consequences. I might get punched in the face. I might get shot. Right. But we live in a culture for the most part where, you know, there's not those kinds of consequences. So people can jump to that because there's the safety our culture has provided. Well, think about keyboard warriors. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we get, I mean, we've gotten flag on our own YouTube, on social media. There's been a ton of people that have received that. Like if any person, let's, I call you into a duel. No, you're going to insult my honor. It'd you're going to accuse me. Game changer. Yeah. I, I, there'd be fewer, there'd be fewer trolls, right? Because people would realize that there's, there's not, um, Unless this is like essential, like if you are in a place where you're running your business or you're dealing with somebody and this is the last resort, like I need to bring a critical spirit to this situation, um, knowing that this is going to offend the person and they're going to put their their defenses up um, and this might end in disaster, uh, but this worth it because given the the situation, I have to go to this point, then criticism is fine, right? But we use criticism when maybe a lot of other tactics should come before it, right? And so I, I like that. And I, I like one of the things he says is, um, uh, do you know someone you would like to change and regulate and improve? Good, that is fine. I'm all in favor of it. But why not begin with yourself? From a purely selfish standpoint, that is a lot more profitable than trying to improve others. Yes, and a lot less dangerous. Don't complain about how the snow on your neighbor's roof says Confucius when your own doorstep is unclean. And it's kind of, I mean, there's so many phrases like that, you know, not judging others when you can take care of your own self. And I, I've kind of been hearing a lot from different people I've listened to in books I'm reading, kind of like getting your own house in order, right? Before you you try and change the world, get your own house in order. And yeah, there might be something other people are doing that's worth criticizing as it were. But if you can just grind and improve yourself and, and, and ensure that there's less things about you that can be criticized and the way you're raising your family and the way that you're running your business, then from a, like he says, a selfish standpoint, Hey, you're going to be better off. Even if they don't improve, if you're improving, you're better off. You can fight the battle to try and improve somebody else. And it ends up leading into a war, which causes everybody to suffer. Or you can try and find ways to, to improve relationships. And he also says any fool can criticize, condemn and complain. And most fools do, but it takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. No, oh, I, I underlined the same thing. Did you? Or highlight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> word for word, per, pretty much. No, word for word. So it, it does. It, think about this. How many times have you wanted to just snap back at someone? Right. I, I used to do this at, at, my, at my previous job all the time. I would write out emails and I would put it in my draft and I'd wait a few hours before I sent it. Right. Because I know at that moment, if I sent that at that, I've done it before. And I know other I know people have walked away from jobs because they knew that that email that they send would be the end for them. So there's a lot of, it takes a lot of restraint, right? Like it says, any fool can criticize, condemn and complain. And most fools do, right? And, it, and it's foolish, right? To put yourself in a scenario where you're going to let a few strokes of the key be the end of you, whether it's at your job, whether it's in a relationship, whatever scenario it is, right? And then again, it says, but it takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. So the the other side of it is like, hey, put that in the drafts. Or if if you know <laughs> you're mad at another person and you want to go old school and write a letter, take the time to write that. I mean, the Abraham Lincoln principle is so so powerful. I mean, if and again, these level up reviews were were trying to relate it to reselling, but this stuff extends to all places in life. And so even if there's individuals that you just you know, you're upset about write, write that letter and just keep it in that drawer and just leave it there. Now, make sure you get rid of it or you put it in a place that no one else can get, get to. Cause I, I've heard of people too, that have like accidentally left things behind and they didn't go so well, but it, it's so, it's so key. I mean, just think about, I mean, I was thinking about today, I was watching a, a YouTube video about, um, 
I'm trying to be delicate here. So eBay had their seller celebration. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's called the celebration. And there were some major difficulties. I know you were busy. You had school. And I was trying to hop on this Friday and I could not get on. Like it was, <laughs> I don't know what happened. Like it all collapsed. And for me, it was like, hey, you know what? Maybe it's a good thing. There's a lot of people trying to get on. It's a good thing if the system crashed, right? But the other side you can get into, you can get a bit uber critical right? eBay doesn't care about resellers. eBay, you know, is only about themselves and da, 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 da. And it's like, well, we, you don't know the whole story, right? We don't know. Now I know there's precedents about like, Hey, you know, this has happened before and happened before, but it's always good to give people the benefit of that. You don't know what they're going through. You yeah. don't. Yeah. And actually, um, my, my pastor had said something a while back that I thought was really profound. And it basically was the, the, a lot of times we, somebody can say something and it can be taken as like, maybe they're they're It's negative towards you. Right. But it could also be taken. Not like, oh, yeah, that's true. Probably 99% of the time they're actually being like, they're, they're kind of underhandedly insulting you. Right. I, I remember I worked at, at a, uh, when I worked at direct TV, some of the people who worked with me, coworkers, man, I learned that firsthand is they would say little comments to you and with like a smile on their face. And you were like, that was the most underhanded insult I've ever heard. And you kind of just have to sit there and nod. And uh, my pastor said, like, when people do that, he goes, it's easier to actually just assume that they didn't mean the harm by it, that they, they, they were, weren't, it wasn't an insult. They were actually just saying whatever they said, because even though that might not be true, if you just assume like, well, they didn't mean anything by it, then you're not losing any sleep. You're not upset. And maybe you're not actually falsely, you know, putting something on them that maybe they were innocent of. Maybe they didn't mean what you kind of took it to mean. So unless they explicitly word for word say, I'm coming after you, you're the worst, whatever it is, um, just assume that they meant the best in it. And you're actually going to sleep better at night, right? Like things aren't going to be as bad for you. And, you know, if you can do that, I think that's really helpful. And it's not easy. Again, it's not natural. The first thing we want to do is say like, I think they said that like talking about me in a group, like someone says, well, you know, some people are and they say something you're like, I think that was aimed at me. Just assume it wasn't right. Like it doesn't, it, it's easier. It's better for you to assume that it's, it wasn't. And he ends the first chapter by giving this little short story. Um, Such a good story. Yeah. From Reader's I just, and it was one of those, like, I don't want to say like I was almost tearing up, but like there was a lot of like emotions. A hallmark in moment. It really was because um, the, the story is called a father forgets. And just a, a brief summary of it. It basically is, story of a dad who walks into his son's room, sees him laying, you know, like sleeping like a little child would sleep all innocent. And like, you could tell this is a a baby, right? Like just a, you know, five, six year old kid, maybe a little older. And just seeing how innocent and helpless this child is. And then the dad is going through his day about how he kind of essentially held the boy to a standard of his own life, right? His own like stand up, do this. Don't, don't, don't do these things. Don't get your knees dirty. Don't get on the floor. Don't play with this. Don't. And he's just all day long, basically writing his son and making, uh, not appreciating his son. And then at the end of the day, the son just runs up, gives him a hug and goes to bed. And it's like the son loved him and he was holding, I mean, I love the line here. He says, um, he says the habit of finding fault of reprimanding Exactly. Is that what you highlighted? Exactly. The habit of finding fault of reprimanding. This was my reward to you for being a boy. It was not that I did not love you. It was that I expected too much of youth. I was measuring you by the yardstick of my own years. Right. And just think about that. Like how many people in your life do you're like, you should know better than this. You should. But to realize that you are at the place you're at now because of the experiences you've had, the things you've had to learn. You probably have made the same mistakes other people are making now. And when you recognize that you're at where you're at, because you probably did a lot of the same things people are doing now, maybe it's like, how, how could you make that mistake with, you know, this thing you're, you're, you've lost my company money. Well, how many times in your career did you lose your company money, right? As you're learning these things. And so when you can kind of forget, and, and the reason why I'm so like kind of touching is it's like, I've got a son, right? And yeah, sometimes he does silly, goofy things. And it's like, why did you knock over that vase? Why did you break that? Why did you do this? I've told you a hundred times to stop playing with the door and you smash your fingers and I get upset with him. And it's like, he's trying to figure life out and he hasn't got 30 years of experience yet. And he hasn't learned the things I've learned. And I, my job is to guide him and teach him, but to also recognize that he's not where I'm at yet. And so I can't hold him to the standards of my life. Um, I need to love and appreciate him and encourage him, encourage him and not just discipline and reprimand him. And I think that's so crucial for the way we deal with everybody. 
pure hustle parenting. Yeah. Now I did, I did think about my own kid and in a sense, like even right now as a reseller, as an entrepreneur, whatever you want to call it, I, I'm kind of like bothered that the fact that my son isn't taking this on, right? He's, he's 15 years old. He ha- I told him the other day, I said, you have all the tools at your disposal for free. You have the mega light box for apparel. You have the small light box. You have, you know, your, your dad who is giving you free advice all the time is always available. He's not just a DMOA. He's literally in front of you and he just won't do it. Right. And then I, the other thing I battled with is, you know, I was a big sports guy when I was in school. Now I wasn't great at sports, but I love sports. But my son is, he's, he's taller. He's, he's a skinnier dude. Like he, he could, he could kill it at sports, but it's just not his jam. Like it's not his thing. And so it's very easy, right? Like to do what it says here. I was measuring you by the yardstick of my own years, right? It's very, you know, you know, those parents that live through their kids, mm. right? I, you don't have to be an educator. I mean, I saw it all the time in education. Like, you know, it's the loudest parent in the stands, mm. right? Like, yeah. And you're like, what? Chill out, man. It's just a, it's just a high school game. Mm. Right. But, but we all, we all know those, we all know those parents, right? We, even in preschool, you see it, right? The way they dress up their kids, the way they, you know, and, and and here's the thing. It's very easy for us to do that with anybody, right? With anybody, even with other resellers, right? I I get caught in this trap that sometimes, you know, somebody will ask me a question. I'm like, come on, like, you can't just Google, you can't figure that out. But I'm like, whoa, 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 no, 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 no. Like I was that same person five, six years ago. I didn't know what I was doing. I had no idea. So if if in the reselling community you you see people and, and they're making mistakes, maybe it's the fact that you're measuring them based on what you already knew. And maybe it's it's time to change that mindset. Right. And so it's it's super, I don't know, encouraging to read this because it applies on so many levels. And he ends that chapter, he says, instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. It's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism. And it breeds sympathy, tolerance, and kindness to know all is to forgive all. As Dr. Johnson said, God himself, sir, does not propose to judge man until the end of his days. Why should you and I? Right? So, I mean, you can you can go for his rounds with that, but that's the thing. Like, in the end, you know, understand that people are coming from different places. And, and to automatically be in a place of condemnation just, just kills any ability to motivate and that's what the next chapter is about right the big secret of dealing with people yeah the big secret of dealing with people um yeah so the second chapter really has um probably i mean i haven't read the whole book yet um so there's probably better takeaways Uh, but this one really reminds me of a lot of what we read in chris voss uh, with never split the difference, which you should read if you haven't read. I'm yes, telling you, one of the it. one of the best influential books as far as reselling has gone for us. Um, but really, what this book, what this chapter talks about is, if you want somebody to do something, you have to make them want to do it. It has to be something they want to do, um, and it can't be something that you're just forcing on them. Now, you can. I mean, I mean happens in boot camp, right? You can have a drill instructor yelling at you and telling you to do things and you do it because you have to. But just think about it that at a job. Like if you're working at a job and you've got a boss who's just harsh and telling you have to do this and you don't understand why you're doing it. It's not really what you want to do. It's not your passion. You don't really care. You'll do it as long as they're standing over your shoulder and the moment they walk away, you know, you kind of do the, you know, roll your eyes and then not give your all anymore. It's like you're, you're, you know that this is, you're doing it because you have to do it, not because you want to do it. So the secret, and he, he gives so many steps in this chapter is the secret. It sounds like you're talking about the secret, <laughs> the secret, but the, the secret, the, the steps, the, the strategy, the truth is you have to find a way to make them want to do it. They've got to find the why, right? They've got to understand why it is. And I just think about like with me, with teaching, trying to teach this generation of, of students, the importance of reading is is one of the most difficult things I can imagine a person doing because there's just not a love for reading anymore. There's so many other easier forms of entertainment that people can get. So reading seems boring, pointless. I always have students say it doesn't mean anything. So I spend the first like week and a half, two weeks of school, like my entire focus, all I'm trying to do, and then I revisit it throughout the entire year is this is why it's important. This is why reading This is why critical thinking, this is why communication and being able to articulate your thoughts is important. 
It will make you more money. It will make you happier. It'll make you have better relationships. It is a superpower. It, I'm telling you, if you can read more, you will do more in life. If you can articulate your thoughts, if you can think about the things you're consuming, whether it's visually, audio, reading, how, however you're consuming information, you're going to be a more successful person in anything, whether you want to play sports, whether you want to be a doctor, whether you want to code video games. And until they realize that, wait a minute, I want to be a successful YouTuber, right? Like a lot of my students, that's what they want. It's like, what if I told you that I can teach you how to communicate better to your audience so that your audience will be more engaged and you'll make more money? It's like, oh, I could see why it's important. Okay. So I'm going to teach you reading. Reading is going to help you with that. Right. And if I can convince them like, yeah, I want to be able to, this is important to me, but if they don't see the why, if they don't believe this is important, if they don't want to do it, all you're doing is forcing compliance until you're not forcing it anymore and standing over their shoulder. And then the compliance goes out the window. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's very, very true. And it, and it's with anything it, it, it has to be. And I, but again, you know, we go back and forth, right? You've mentioned discipline before, right? But I think in this scenario, it's very much the idea that people have to be in order for you. And right. We're talking about, it says fundamental techniques in handling people, right. And getting people to, you know, be friends with you and winning over people, right? That's the goal here. You have to provide a scenario where it's something that they want, right? So he gives a scenario of, of John D. Rockefeller and the fact that John D. Rockefeller was willing to give millions to put together a hospital in China to care for millions of poor, poor people that he had never seen or would never see, right? And, and, the, and the big win for, for Rockefeller and others was they wanted legacy, Right. Even though they weren't going to be here, they wanted their names on something. Right. That people would remember them. Right. If, if they just had said, hey, we want you to help these random people out here just for the sake of helping them. I don't know. Right. I don't know. But now John D. Rockefeller, I mean, there's different interpretations of John D. Rockefeller. Some seen as one of the most altruistic people that ever lived, even though he was richest. And then there's other people that see him as somebody who was, you know, considered one of those robber barons, which I lean towards the side that he was altruistic. Uh, but here's the thing. Everybody has their rationale and their reason for doing things. And, and he mentioned that over and over again in this chapter. But what I like what he says is, yeah, I'll read it right here. If some people are so hungry for a feeling of importance that they actually go insane to get it, imagine what miracle you and I can achieve by giving people honest appreciation. Uh, <laughs> appreciation. I just destroyed that whole sentence. By giving people honest appreciation this side of insanity. So let me give you context to that. He goes, I don't know, how'd you feel about the side that he said that people become insane when they want appreciation so much and they don't get it, they go crazy? Yeah, well, I mean, he, he kind of goes through the um, kind of like the different hierarchies of needs that have been presented, right? Like why people live and basically, becoming says, a deep podcast. <laughs> basically says that that on top of all of those, what all of them kind of have in common and one that's sometimes not even mentioned, but is really the heart of it is that everybody has the desire to be great or the desire to be important. Right. And, and and then later he says, um, if you tell me how you get your feeling of importance, I'll tell you what you are. That determines your character. And so he talks about people like like Orlando was saying, who um, in order to get that feeling of importance, there are some people. And again, this is not saying that everybody who has, you know, a mental breakdown or everybody who has different physical ailments, it's because that's what they want. But there are some people who seek attention or seek importance through sympathy and um, they may act a certain way. Gosh, I'll, I'll, I'll be totally transparent here. When I was, when I was young, like really young elementary age, I was not the cool popular kid. I was the oldest child. So I didn't have like the street smarts. I didn't have somebody kind of teaching me. I was trying to figure out like socialization on my own. And I realized really quick that as like a six, seven year old boy, that if I was hurt or there was something wrong with me, I was really sad. I got a lot of attention from the girls in the class, right? They'd be like, oh, are you okay, Michael? Are you okay? And, and I love I, these stories. Whenever Mike brings the stories I've never heard, they're always awesome. And so I I thrived off that. Like, it was like, ooh, like, like all of a sudden I get attention. If it's like, I, all of a sudden I'm really sad today and I got my head down. I, next thing you know, the people who aren't my friends want to be my friends and help me and make me feel better. And it encouraged me to seek sympathy, right? fake injuries or whatever it was. And, and it's sad to say that that was me. I mean, it was a long time ago. I've grown up since then. But the, to say that there are people who can go that way in life, and sometimes they actually, in order to seek those feelings of importance, if they're not getting it fulfilled in their real life, they might actually have a legitimate mental breakdown 
and have almost like a psychotic, and this is what he presents here, um, reality, a fake reality in which they are important and they've got, you know, people are here for them and they're special. Maybe they work for the government or like well, we various see those things. crazy stories in the news all the time, right? People faking cancer or people faking well, an but, incident. But that that's, happened. but that's faking though. But like there are people who like actually will have like legitimate, they, they have a psychotic breakdown and their, their views. And again, he doesn't saying that all of it is because of this. There are some that are caused by other things, yeah, right? He's saying this is an extreme case that there, there are people who this is the case for. So it's not saying like, if you've had a psychotic breakdown, it's because no, you wanted attention or you needed fulfillment. But he's, saying that there are those who you know like he gives an example of a lady who thought that she was gonna have a bunch of children and that her um, husband was gonna love her and take care of her and all of these things and she ended up marrying a guy who didn't love her and didn't take care of her and wasn't kind to her and she never had kids and so she ended up living in this f like fake reality where she lived somewhere else and she had she was royalty she married into this royal family and she was having a kid every single day and the doctor when asked like if you could fix her, would you? It was kind of like, no, because she's happier now than she was in, in the real world, right? And the, the, the idea though, and again, like we can learn a lot from extremes, is that everybody at some level wants to feel important. I mean, just think about like how that changes the way you would interact with somebody. Like I, if I think about the fact that my wife wants to feel valued and important, my son wants to feel like what he's doing is important that what he's interested in, even if it's a silly drawing that he did that doesn't make any sense or a story he's trying to tell me if I'm like, that's dumb, that's dumb. And I don't listen to it. All I'm doing is crushing his spirits. But if I can say like, wow, that's the best drawing I've ever seen, or maybe not lie to him, but like, wow, you're so good. You keep trying, keep, keep you. That's way better than last time. And, and you make them feel like what they're doing is important. Right. I know a lot of parents who they're not involved in what their kids are doing. Their kids are involved in a video game. And they're like, that's dumb. I don't want to learn anything about it. Well, maybe if you just, show some interest in it. Say like, man, like you are getting good at that game. That's pretty impressive. They feel valued. And all of a sudden you can maybe use that now to, and again, this isn't like manipulating a bad way. Well, he way. does address that later on. He addresses the difference between, you know, flattery mm -hmm. and, and true appreciation. Mm -hmm. Right. So he does, he does address that. Right. Yeah. Because it's, it, it's a hard line. I mean, it, it's tough. And depending on, I really think depending on your personality, who you are, like some people have it really easy to come across as genuine and appreciative. There's some people that no matter what way they see, say things, they look like they're just being, they're trying to be conniving. Right. I mean, just the way it goes. Now I love how Dale Carnegie flips it though, in the middle of this chapter, because so this entire time we've been talking about how people want to feel important. People need legacy. People need a why the extreme scenarios that demonstrate this. And then he says, the reason why it's so important to know this is so you can turn it Right. And understand that if you do want to attract people and influence people is you have to be a magnet of appreciation. Right. And he talks about that in an example he gives. He talks about how uh, Andrew Carnegie hires Charles Schwab and pays him a salary of over a million dollars a day. And this is way back. So if you don't know who these are, these are probably the richest men in America in the early 1900s. It'd be a year, right? A million a year. Was it? Yeah. yeah. It was, he said. So he says, why did Andrew Carnegie pay a million dollars a year? or more than $3,000 a day. That's big money. We're talking about early 1900s. Okay. This is unheard of. Yeah. When okay. and he says like $50 a week was like a high salary. Yeah. That's yeah. like, the, so that's $3,000 a day is like a big. And I'm not trying that. to give you guys a history lesson, but this is, this is, you, you think about Bezos right now. You think about Gates, you think about all these individuals. This is the Bezos and the Gates of the early 20th century. Okay, and says, why did Andrew Carnegie pay a million dollars a year or more than $3,000 a day to Charles Schwab? Why? Because Schwab was a, ge a genius? No, because he knew more about the manufacture of steel than other people? Nonsense. Charles Schwab told me himself that he had many men working for him who did more and knew more about the manufacture of steel than he did. Schwab says that he was paid the salary, salary largely because of his ability to deal with people. I asked him how he did it. Here are his secrets he set down to his own words. Where does it have to be cast in eternal bronze and hung in every home and school, every shop and office in the land? And I'm going to skip it down to what he says. I consider my ability to arouse enthusiasm among my people the greatest asset I possess and the way to develop the best that is in a person is by appreciation and encouragement. I'm hearty in my approbation. And this is a, a different word for approbation. You can use is approval. Right, I'm hearty in my approval and lavish in my praise. All right, and again, this is applies in multiple levels. This applies at the 
I, I can tell you, even with myself, I have a lot of connections in, in, in San Diego at thrift stores, at, at wholesale places. And it's because I'm not a jerk to people. All right. I mean, you know, we, we talk about Jovial Orlando when we talked about the Chris Voss book, but but it's who I am. Like, I, I generally do care for people. And, and sometimes to the point that it's just like people are like, dude, like, why are you laughing so much? Right. I, actually, the last YouTube, somebody said, Orlando, like, what's wrong with you? You're laughing at something that's not even funny. I don't know. I don't know. I took a nap that day. But the, the reason is I just enjoy being around people. I enjoy talking to people. But what it's done inadvertently, not not the fact that I go in and I talk to people because I'm like, huh, I'm going to get a better deal here. I'm going to make things happen. No, it's if if I care for people and people sense I genuinely care for them, people are more willing to help you. It's just, it's a very simple business principle. Yeah. Yeah. Being able to, and again, encourage people to, with what it is that they're interested in or being, um, he talks a lot about like smiling and those things later on, uh, you know, being connecting with people, being genuine. And, you know, he gives an example that I thought was pretty good in this section uh, about like a kid who got beat up by a bully and, um, and the kid wasn't eating and there was a problem. It's like, how do we, you know, we've yelled at this kid. We've, we've disciplined this kid. We can't get him to eat his food. And then eventually it was like, all right, here's the way we get this kid to, to eat. Hey, you know, that bully that beat you up, you ever want to be big and strong enough to actually get revenge. You're going to need to eat some food. If you eat this food, you're going to get big and strong. And it's like, man, I use that with my son all the time. Like you want to get big and strong like that. You got to eat your food. Right. And it's like, all of a sudden now it's something he wants. Yeah. Get big and strong. And then he's eating the food that it was like before he didn't want to touch. And, you know, because you, you've changed it from do this because I said do it, which at times that's okay. Like there is a time and a place when it's, you don't have a chance to explain. Don't run out onto the street because I said, and maybe later on I'll explain it's dangerous and this is why, but I don't have time to, to, to teach you that in the moment. I'm going to grab you and, and stop you from doing it. But if you're trying to make an employee, if you're trying to make a friend, if you're trying to make somebody like get on board with what it is you're, you're doing, You've got to find what inspires them. You got to find what it is that's motivating them and use that as the source, right? And I think back to um, when I was um, working at the the school with Orlando, um, and I was doing a lot of the video stuff there. And I was approached in two different ways by different groups of people to do video. Oh, yeah. And sometimes it was like, Mike, we need this. I need this video by this time, this day, and it needs to have these things in it. And I'd be like, well, that's really hard for me to do. And it's actually, like, I don't have the stuff I need for that. And, I don't, and it was kind of like, a, we don't really care. We'll try and get you what you need, but we need it by this day. And then there was, you know, another individual, a superintendent at the time who would like pull me in and be like, I've got this vision. I got this idea. And he explained it to me like, you're the guy to do this. Can you help me with this? Like, I think I, I, that last video that you did, like that was so perfect. If we can get that kind of like energy on this, I think people will believe it and they'll get on this mission. And then at that, I'm like, yeah, I could do that too. Because all of a sudden I'm being pulled in. He's pointing to other stuff I've done. True story, I'm, by the way. Yeah, True no, story. absolutely. You know. There. And, and those things, like it's, it's a different way of encouraging. Now, was he just, you know, able to, to use me in that sense? I think in a, in a genuine way, I, I think he was believing what he was saying and he was encouraging and all of those things. And I felt it and I was on board. And then another person, it's like, you're doing this by this date. And it didn't matter what I said. And I didn't believe in it. And I didn't want to do it. And I grumbled and complained the whole time. And I didn't do my best work. Right. And so there's a huge difference there. And, and just think like he gives an example. He says one quote, he says, once I did bad and that I heard ever twice I did good, but that I heard never. Right. And, and how true is that? Like there's a, uh, Jonathan Swift, the great satirist, uh, in, uh, uh Gulliver, Gulliver's travels, has a kind oh, we're of getting serious here, bringing the English education. That's right. It has there's a whole section in there which I thought was interesting, where uh, at one point Gulliver goes to a place where instead of there being punishment, like people got like rewarded for things, right? Like there wasn't like you punish crime; it was you you got benefit for doing what was right. Hey, I pay my taxes all the time, so I get rewarded. I do this, I get rewarded, and not like hey, I've paid my taxes consistently, like a great citizen for 30 years of my life and one time I'm a little late and I'm struggling and next thing you know, I'm in jail versus, hey, you've been paying your taxes. We're going to reward you with more stuff, right? Wouldn't and that be nice in real life? Exactly. I mean, but think about that. Like if you can motivate the people in your life with encouragement and like you did that really well because it's so true, you know, a reputation takes a lifetime to build and only one little thing and it's gone, right? And the same is true with like work. Like I feel I just as a, a personal example, like recently I was 
crushing it on everything. My lessons were great. I sent out all the emails to parents. I did this, I did that. And then it's like one thing, like in, in a list of, of 50 to-do list things, like one thing that was kind of a minor thing. I forgot to hit save on attendance. I think I talked about that at one thing on one class. And it's like, well, that's all anybody's going to think of Mr. You know, Mike for this school year. It's like, oh man, he's the guy who can't do attendance, right? It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. How about all the great things I've done, right? And so you've got to think about that for the people in your life. They're going to mess up on something, but try and encourage them on the things they're doing well and the things they're doing right. And you'll be surprised that the thing they did wrong, they probably know it and they'll probably fix it. And maybe you need to address it. But usually if you can encourage them, like, man, this project, you did A, B, and C really well. Like these were amazing. And if, if they know they had A, B, C, and D, and they're like, yeah, like, thanks for acknowledging all the great things I did in this project. Next time I will make sure that those emails get out to everybody on time, right? Like whatever <laughs> it is, that is, it, it kind of can take care of itself. And so encourage instead of condemning. And you'd be surprised at how much more motivated employees, motivated friends, uh, people around you are, it, it's just going to be a better situation. Oh, that was around. my direct boss. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm telling you that like, uh, even though we, we worked for a short time, <laughs> He probably made more impact than most bosses I've had in my entire life in that short time, right? Because it was genuine. It was, and that's the key word. So he takes us to that next section. He says, in the long run, flattery, flattery will do you more harm than good. Flattery is counterfeit. And like counterfeit money, it will eventually get you in trouble if you pass it to someone else, right? So you got to be careful, right? It, it's a hard line. And, and here's the thing, especially if you don't know someone like, you know, I find this all the time. People, when I when I'm trying to you know broker deals and resell and make bulk buys, if I go too much on the hey you're awesome hey this mm. is cool like da 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 they're like yeah they start they start backing off flattery stinks nobody likes flattery yeah and and it's it's a, I'm telling you it's not easy though mm. right it's easier to flatter because mm -hmm. right? it's insincere yeah it's insincere so you can find whatever right yeah. you can say whatever you want whether it's you know, you're out on a date, whether it's you're dealing with your kids, whether it's your spouse, whatever it is, flattery is really easy because you don't really have to know that person. Hmm. Right. But if it's something genuine, right, it takes work. And he says, don't be afraid of enemies who attack you. Be afraid of the friends who flatter you. And hmm. so on the other side, I think everybody, they want to feel important. But if they feel that somebody is manipulating them or using them. I mean, we see that all the time in the reseller community. I mean, that's one of the stigmas that we have, right? Instead of being seen as individuals that are providing a service, that we're connecting people to things they've lost, you know, a long time ago, that, you know, we're, we're helping better the economy, that we're providing goods. Instead, we have the stigma because there have been a lot of people that have used flattery to sell things on ads, right? I mean, you look at our YouTube ads, sometimes they come out, I'm like, what is this? They, you know, sometimes uh, like on YouTube, I, I'll, I'll go and I'm trying to answer comments and I got to listen to the ads. My son goes, scammer, scammer. I'm like, hey, I know, son. He's like, don't don't be like that. I, I'm like, I, I get it. And the reason is because these people are trying to sell you a dream. And the way that you're trying to sell you a dream is by flattering you, right? Telling you anyone can do this, right? You're just as able as everybody else. You're da da da, da and, and they give you all the praise. They have no idea who you are, but they're giving you all this praise that they have no concept of what you've been through and what, what's going on in your own life. So, yeah, I mean, just think about the difference. Like, I mean, again, I'm going to use teaching as an example because that's my like normal career, but the same if you've got an employee, if you've got somebody in your life, you know, to find an exact thing, like if someone just says, like, Wow, you're such a great teacher, it's like, Okay, thanks. But if admin comes in and watches my lesson and says, you know what, the way you engage your students and specifically Johnny, like he is never engaged. And I saw him paying attention. You really were able to like connect that to him. It's like they were paying like that is appreciation. That's not flattery, right? It's like they had to actually understand, not just like you're doing such a great job. And it's like, oh, OK, thanks. That doesn't mean anything to me. So imagine if, if the people who in your life that make the biggest like influence as far as appreciation go, it's because they have specifics. They actually genuinely had to look in. Maybe, maybe it was somebody who had to like, I mean, if you've got an employee, instead of just criticizing or, or flattery, actually look at the job they've done and find something worth praising. Don't just say great job, but like find, man, that was the way you sent that email to that client. Like that was worded so well, like then and make if, sure you know what it says in, in the email. Yeah, like don't just don't just say whatever. <laughs> They're like, what, what did I send? And yeah. you're like, uh, you're done. Exactly, yeah. So you, it's got to be genuine because then if later on you're like, hey, can you help draft this email I'm sending to this other client? 
they're going to be more willing to do it because they know you appreciate them for that and not just like, hey, you're such a great email person. Can you do these, uh, all my emails for me? Nobody's going to want to do that, right? But if you've said like, or can you check through my email that I'm about to send? Like the one you sent to to client A yesterday, like that is like what our company needs. Like, can, like teach us how to do that. Like that's totally different. It's a different way of approaching it. And so fine. I mean, same thing goes with a spouse or with a friend, right? Don't just give flattery, give specifics and it will, it will change. Uh, it'll change everything. And, and just look, I mean, look for like specifics. Like if you can take nothing else from this, find a specific, it changes everything. And, and, um, he ends this section by saying, and maybe you have something else in there you want to mention, uh, but he just says, give honest and sincere appreciation. No, that's it. That's exactly what I was going to end on. So, Hey, and by the way, when we do these level up reviews, understand we're speaking on the authority of the author. Yeah, I'm, right? I'm a nobody. Yeah, well, well I mean, you know, sometimes it comes across where like we're directly yeah. saying like, we know this is the way to do this. We've experienced now. I can say with this, I've experienced a lot of this. I can speak on authority on a lot of these topics, but understand we're all learning together. All right, it's time for a quick social media spiel. So if you haven't been following us on social media, we are Pure Soul Podcast on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. We are Pure Soul Cast on Twitter. Uh, you can always, you know, if you like, come over to YouTube. By the way, we're almost at 4K. So if you could hit that subscribe button, that'd be great. Hit that bell notification in case we do a live and we drop videos. You can always give us a call, 619-738-1170, 619-738-1170. We would love it. Maybe we, we, have, we have a reflection episode, right? This is our 11th book. Isn't that crazy? Right. I was thinking the other day, you know, one of the worst questions I would get when I did interviews is, I, or when I gave them or when I got them would be like, tell us about the last five books you read and which one was like your favorite. Right. Because there was points in my life where I didn't read books, even as an educator. Like, I know that sounds terrible, but you know, I was like, now, now you have it right. No matter what. And even if, if you know, that question's coming, you can just listen to our podcast and you're good to go. Right. Well, I'm see you helping you out. So there you go. Right. You can also uh, shoot us an email at purespodcast at gmail.com. That's purespodcast at gmail.com. And as always, thank you all for the reviews on iTunes. We love getting the feedback on the level up reviews. It's really helpful to us because, you know, we go back and forth and now we're finding that our level up reviews are, are getting just as many listens or regular episodes. Mm -hmm. Right. It's kind of it's been it's been interesting and dynamic. And so appreciate that. And as always, thank you for, you know, the shirts have been are being purchased, the donations, all that good stuff, because it always helps. Always, always, always helps. So thank you so much. All right. Are we ready for the last chapter? Well, the yeah. last chapter. So part one is weird. The part one's only three chapters, and part two is like this whole mega side. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a little bit um well, actually, it's about the same is amount it? of of uh of pages. Um, part one and part two. Okay. Maybe a little bit shorter. Um, the, I think the chapter is a little shorter in part two, but we'll just do part one today, especially because I feel like there's so much we're getting out of this. So rather than trying to rush through part yeah, two. I mean, um, so um, in this section, uh, chapter three, uh, it starts off with a quote, he who can do this has the whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way. And basically the principle he's trying to implement here is that and it kind of goes back to the the second chapter is, is you've got to uh, the principle he says at the end is arouse an other uh, in the other person an eager want and he brings up the idea that humans are very interested in themselves and what they want right like that's that's a big part of us but we can use that right he says uh, the rest of us are just like you we are all interested in what we want um, so every act you perform since the day you were born was performed because you wanted something. And if you think about that, if you think about the fact, and you kind of talked about that in the, uh, a little bit with the idea of, you know, people doing things that are are good for humanity and things that seem kind of selfless in a lot of ways, it's because when you donate money to somebody, it's because you want to help the, that person. You want to help that organization more than you want the money, right? You're still getting what you want. Um, usually a selfless act is still in a lot of ways selfish in the sense that you value maybe helping others or seeing other people flourish or whatever it is more than you value buying a new toy or trinket. And so you, it's, you're still getting what you value. And so you've got to find what it is that other people value. You've got to think from their perspective. What is it that they are actually wanting? Because if you can find out what it is that other people are interested in, what is driving their motivations, then you can then use that to help motivate them in the things you want them to do. No, agreed. And it's, and it's interesting the the story that he gives, uh, the the idea that you know Carnegie again going back to that you know um, the mogul of the early 1900s, 
he basically had this ongoing wager, right? He, this this idea that you know, this his mom was trying to get a hold of her kids. Actually, it's his sister in law trying to get worried about you know was worried because kids went off to Yale and and wouldn't hear from them. So he wrote them a letter and told them about that there'd be you know money in the envelope and there was no money in the envelope. Well, guess what? They contacted him. Yeah, the, right? the bet the bet was I can get them to respond to me without even asking them to respond to me. And she's like, you can't do it. And yeah, he said, there's five dollars in the envelope. I hope you this is helpful for you. I wanted to give this to you, but he didn't send them money. So they responded back like, thank you so much for the letter. Just want to let you know the money didn't make it in. Right. So like they he realized that he had to drive on their wants. Well, they're going to want a the money that he said he was giving them. And so he's getting what he wants, a response to hear back from them. And so, man, that I mean, it's it's such a I mean, it's kind of a, a silly trick, but doesn't it show that if you can find out what it is that people want, then you could use that as the motivation. Agreed. And it, and it's it's so key in everything. I mean, in sales, you're taught, you know, create urgency. Mm. There's a book about leadership and bringing on change by the professor in Harvard. I forget his name. Last name was Cotter. And one of the things he says, you, you have to create urgency, like for people to change, for people to act, they have to see a reason why. Right. And those boys, right, they wanted their money. Right. So they responded back. And this applies on on so, so many levels. I mean, even, you know, uh, in the reselling aspect, you know, find items that people want. Right. So they respond and they buy them. Right. And in social media. Right. You provide an avenue where people like I, I get this. all. We're getting this a lot lately about, hey, I want to grow my social media. And some of it's because they want to bring greater sales to their store. Or sometimes people just want to have a social media presence. And we're not social media. What do you what what do you call the those people that influence people on social media? Influencers. No, 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 no. But there's the there's the influence, and then there's like the social media people that are like, here's how to grow your social media. Do you get what I'm Experts, saying? Experts, gurus. No, there, there's a term for it. Is there? I forget what it is. But anyways, we're not that at all. But what I can say is what I've learned is that if you provide people right a reason to respond, like you pro, you continue providing value they'll respond. If you don't provide value, like for example, people are like all the time, Hey, I want to sell stuff on Instagram. And I say, Hey, if you want to sell stuff on Instagram, don't post what you're selling, provide value, provide, you know, here, here's, here's one way to do this in your reselling. Here's another way. Here's how to find what is authentic, what is not, whatever way you provide value. And then when you're, you know, showing a product or whatever it is, you're able to convert that into a sale without even expecting it. Yeah. It's so good. And he gives like multiple, like, email or letter examples, the difference in like kind of like sales. Um, and th they're all really kind of the same concept, two different ways of doing it. One is the selfish way, like you're asking the person for something. The other one is phrasing it of here's the, here's what you need. And here's how I can help you get that. Right. Like even if, you know, it's a, it's a bad situation. You messed up for your client and, and, you know, you need them to correct something. And so you're asking, like, I need more money to make this happen. Instead of saying, like, I need this from you, you provide it as this is the service I can do you. I just need these things, right? So it's it's kind of flipping it. Instead of I need this, it's here's what I can do for you. And I just think about that, like, with interviews. Like, if you're in an interview, you probably do this if you're getting the job. If you're not doing this, you're probably not getting the job. Never ask for how much am I going to get paid right away, <laughs> um, ever. Well, I mean, that's a good example. Uh, uh, just an, simple one. Another one is, you know, when you go into something, a lot of times, why do you want this job, right? Most people aren't going to give the answer of, I just need money. Like, I need this job because I need the money. Um, that's, I'm sure people do. I mean, that, but that's not going to be what's going to make you stand out in the interview, right? The better thing to do is you look at the company and you say, all right, I'm, I, and I do this every time I have an interview somewhere. I read as much about the company as I can. I read their mission statement, right? Because most companies, like every you know board meeting, every team meeting, they're always like, here's our vision. Here's our, we are the company that supplies, blah, blah. blah. And they have like their two sentence phrase, their one sentence phrase. So I learned that and I memorize it. And then I go in and I include that. I'm like, well, I know that your company strives to provide customers with this, 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 and this. I think my experience can help you reach those customers because I can provide you this. I can provide you that. Instead of saying like, this is, you know, this is what your company is going to do for me. You tell them why they should hire you, right? Like you want to reach customers in this market. I am, I'm familiar with these customers. I already know how to reach them and I can connect your product with them. Or, you know, if it's a teaching job, like I know that you guys strive for technology excellence and and my skill set will help further you in that mission, right? Now, all of a sudden, you're an asset to them and not um, 
I just need this job you're going to give me, right? So we all kind of know that when it comes to jobs. But then when it comes to dealing with clients, sometimes we flip on that, right? It's like, um, I, you know, give me this money and I'll give you this product or whatever it is. But it's like, no, 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 no. You need to convince the other person that they need this thing and that you're providing them a service. Because if you can make them realize you can help them get to where they want, and like Orlando was saying with social media, there's a big difference from somebody saying, hey, like, can you uh, can you sponsor my my product and put it on your show and do this versus, hey, I've got this product. I want to send it to you. I want to give you something to give out to your customers. I believe in this. I think this is something that's going to help you, right? That's a totally different thing. People are going to be more willing or somebody saying, hey, I love the content you're creating. Can I come work for you for free for like a couple of weeks just to learn from you as opposed to, hey, can you give me a job, right? Like those are two very different things. And so if you can recognize that this same principle works not just at the job level, not just at negotiation, because a lot of this reminded me of Chris Voss book, like negotiation stuff. Agreed. But but think about how it even applies to your family relationships with your spouses, with your friends, with your parents, with your cousins, with whatever. If And one of the things he talks about a lot in this is think about the other person's wants in front of your own and think from their perspective. He says, um, if there's any one secret of success, it lies in the ability to get the other person or to to get the other person's point of view and see things from the person's angle as well as from your own. And then a little bit later, he goes on to say, and it's kind of the same concept. If out of reading this book, you get just one thing, an increased tendency to think always in terms of the other people's point of view and see things from their angle. If you get that one thing out of this book, it may easily prove to be the one to be one of the building blocks of your career. And just think about that. Like even, even in, in political debates, right? Or whatever the situation is, if you can see the world from somebody else's perspective, even if you don't agree with it, the, the, the idea they have, hey, they want to do this with the team or they want to do this with the company and I disagree with it. But if you can honestly try and see it from their perspective, what is it they're trying to achieve? What do they want? Why do they want it this way? Can what I want to do um, help them to reach that end goal? Maybe we're working towards the same thing, right? And so if you can see it from their perspective, you're better off, especially if they're only seeing it from their own perspective, you now have the upper hand because you have more knowledge than they do. You have your perspective and their perspective and don't straw man. I mean, that's one thing that's really important is don't just straw man somebody else's viewpoints. They think this, they believe this, they just want the company to do this. They don't care about us. They don't but actually try and think, well, why would? And I remember I used to tell Orlando this because he was one of my my principals is uh, the staff would get upset. The the faculty would be upset because a decision admin would make. And, you know, like sometimes I'd be like, yeah, I don't really agree with this decision that admin would make. But like I would tell him like, look, I know you guys are in a tough position and I'm, I'm sure you guys spent hours in meetings trying to figure out what the best thing was. And maybe this isn't the best for me in my classroom, but as a whole for our school, this is probably the best thing that we need. And I recognize that. And so... If you can see it from their perspective, and then maybe if I have a suggestion to offer, it comes off better as opposed to, I don't understand why you're doing this. This is stupid. You didn't even think about us rather than, hey, I get your end goal here and what you're wanting to do. Um, have you considered this? And you probably already have considered this because I'm sure you know, you've know thought about this, uh, but can you help me understand why your plan is best is totally different than just telling them they're wrong, right? No, agreed. I mean, he gives a great example in here. And I appreciate it when Mike would, uh, you know, be willing to hear my perspective. But uh, uh, Carnegie gives an example about how they rent out a ballroom and they're supposed to be doing courses and they and they were given a certain rate. But then they got a letter and in the letter they were supposed to pay three times more the rent for that ballroom. So obviously he didn't want to pay. And what he does is he writes back and what he writes is, is interesting. He says, I was a bit shocked when I got your letter. But I don't blame you at all. If I had been in your position, again, right, seeing that perspective, he says, I should have probably have written a similar letter myself. Your duty as a manager of the hotel is to make all the profit possible. If you don't do that, you'll be fired and you ought to be fired. Now, let's take a piece of paper and write down the advantages and the disadvantages that will accrue to you if you insist on this increase in rent. Then, and then he says, I took a letterhead and ran a line through the center. It's pretty bold, by the way. Mm -hmm. Created one column advantage and disadvantages. I wrote down on the head advantages, these words, ballroom free. Then I went on to say, you will have the advantage of having the ballroom free to rent for dances and conventions, right? This is basically, he's pushing him. He's like, hey, if you don't show up, you know, it's available for you, right? It's available. But now let's consider the disadvantages. He, he writes a bunch of other stuff too. 
First, instead of increasing your income from me, you're going to decrease it. In fact, you're going to wipe it out because I cannot pay the rent you are asking. I shall be forced to hold these lectures at another place. There's another disadvantage to you. These lectures attract crowds of educated and cultured people to your hotel. That is good advertising for you, isn't it? In fact, if you spent $5,000 advertising in the newspapers, you couldn't bring as many dollars advertising and bring as many people to look at your hotel as I can bring by these lectures. That is worth a lot to a hotel, isn't it? He kind of leaves it at that. And he says, mind you, I got, he ended up getting the reduction, right? He got a 50% reduction instead of the 3,000, 300% increase. Mind you, I got this reduction without saying a word about what I wanted. I talked all the time about what the other person wanted and how he could get it. Right. And it, it's super important to just provide. He, he, here's the value. Here's the value. Here's the value. Not this is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. Because in reality, a lot of people, I mean, even in a reselling community, it, it's very hard to tell people, hey, this is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. But if you can say, hey, here's the value, here's the value. And if in turn, people want to help out, they're willing to. Right. And and again, I, I can't tell you how many times people, it's weird, Mike, and I've shared this with you, where people are super critical of me and I get it. I'm a, you know, I'm easy to criticize. And then they'll reach out to me and ask me like, Hey, what is this item you were talking about over here? What, what, Hey, can you help me out with this? And luckily I'm a pretty forgiving guy, but then I'm like, do you understand? Like most people, and, and this is the monologue in my head. I never DM this, but I'm like, why would I help you? Like there, there's nothing in me that wants to help you. Now I'll help you because you know, I like helping people. And there's other people that I've just flat out just said, you know, I'm sorry, I can't help you out with that. Da, 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 da. But had that person had not even just provided value, but had been supportive and encouraging instead of being malicious, could have turned out a different way. Right. And and I'm saying this out of transparency, like we're all human. Right. I'm not trying to say, hey, implement game theory in your life. <laughs> what I'm telling you is we're all human and we all like to feel appreciated. And and part of that is, you know, this idea of of providing value because if if people know that you're providing value for them, they feel appreciated. It works. Oh, you're, you're close. You got more? No, I'm, you're good. I'm pretty good. All right. So, I there, there, there's the, I I strongly recommend you guys pick up this book. There's so much in here that you guys can can just in every avenue of life. I mean, I would say probably ten out of eleven of our books were good, <laughs> right? So. So I'm going to leave with this. He says, remember, first arousing the other person in eager want. He who can do this has a whole world with him. He who cannot walks a lonely way, right? It's the very beginning of the chapter. And he closes with that because it's very true, right? Get people to understand that you're on their side. You have their perspective in mind. You value them by providing them value. And in turn, right, you'll be able to do what Carnegie ultimately wants you to do is win over people right make them your friends and be able to be influential all at the same time yeah. and with that being said make sure to be real be relevant and be reselling late mm.